maybe not unexpected, but still shocking. Last night, of course, we received the news from Fitch Ratings, where they downgraded Namibia even further. And with us in the studio, independent economist Roland Brown, also co-founder of uh, Cirrus Capital. Welcome, Roland, and thank you, thank you for joining us. Thanks for the invite. Um, Roland, in a nutshell and in layman's terms, what does this latest announcement mean? Okay, so Namibia has been downgraded by Fitch again. We're now two notches below junk rating or below the junk rating threshold. So basically this means that Namibia is no longer considered investment grade uh, when it comes to uh, its government uh, debt issuance. Uh, and so the there's a number of implications for this. Um, one of the implications is that basically the cost of funding, the, the sort of market determined cost of funding will increase. Um, and it will become more expensive for our government to try and fund its deficit. So the difference between the revenue that it collects and the money that it spends every year, uh, it'll be more difficult to fund that from the external world at a reasonable price going forward. Roland, the implications um, of this severe, why did Fitch make this decision? So I think one needs to bear in mind a number of different things when it comes to this. One is simply that um, this rating is a sort of sign of what's going on. It doesn't actually determine very much per se, but it's a good illustration of the economic conditions in the country. Uh, Fitch made the decision for a number of reasons. I think the, the main reasons were that uh, growth has been disappointing, so growth is much lower than Fitch expected. It's more or less in line with what we've been expecting, what the private economists in the country have been expecting. Um, but it's lower than what Fitch was expecting. And then we've also seen a very dramatic increase in government debt levels. So if we go back to 2011 as an example, we had about 16 billion, so one six billion worth of Namibian government debt. Today we sit with very close to 100 billion worth of debt. So this, you know, this enormous increase in debt obviously means that it's more difficult for the country to service that debt, to um, keep on spending the way that we've been spending. And if you consider that over the past few years, we've all got this impression that government is actually reducing its spending. Well, they are, but they're still spending more than they're collecting in tax revenue. And this is despite the fact that we have one of the highest tax revenue to GDP ratios in the world. So we have a phenomenally well-resourced government uh, by global standards relative to the size of the economy, one of the best funded governments in the world. Uh, and yet the government is still trying to spend more money than they're collecting in, in revenue every year. And so we have a government with a major expenditure problem. And what we're seeing at the moment is that we're really struggling to get that expenditure problem under control. And as a result of this, we're borrowing, government's borrowing close to 10 billion Namibia dollars every year. Um, and we're not really seeing the return on that borrowing. So a lot of that borrowing is going into the likes of the civil service wage bill, into servicing debt, into bailing out failing state and enterprises and similar. And we're not really seeing a situation where um, the reform on that expenditure side is allowing government to close that, that um, budget deficit. And so because of that primarily, um, coupled with this low growth, uh, the rating agency decided to downgrade us. Um, we talked about uh, civil service, the salary role there, and it was also mentioned by Fitch. Um, government trying to curb expenditure, but isn't it in a conundrum? Um, we've got high employment, uh, a lot of people in the civil service. What is the solution? Yeah, so high unemployment, uh, yes. Uh, that's a huge challenge for government, but the, the issue around unemployment is, is a particularly critical one. Governments around the world tend not to be the core employers. They tend to create a facilitating environment or enabling environment that allows private companies to create employment. The challenge that our government sits with is it's got one of the most expensive civil service salary bills relative to the size of the economy in the world. So we're the fifth highest civil service wage bill relative to GDP in the world. Uh, and that takes up more than 50% of all the, all the revenue that government collects. So there's not a huge amount of money left over for other things. And if you consider that employing people also requires that you have uh, desks and floor space and, you know, the utilities and S&T and so on for them to do their job. By the time you're done with that plus medical aid, you're sitting at 65 plus percent of total government revenue that just goes to that. And then there's another 15 percent that goes or just under, say, 10 or 12 percent actually that goes to um, servicing debt. Uh, of government revenue and then you know there's the bailing out of the state and enterprises bits and pieces and at the end of the day you left with very little discretionary spend to actually stimulate the economy and so government does sit with a conundrum cutting expenditure dramatically is a is a challenge 
However, this isn't what we necessarily advocate for. What we suggest is that we need to make it much, much easier for the non-government part of the economy to grow. So let's just put this into context. If an economy grows at 7% a year, the size of that economy doubles in 10 years. So in 10 years, you have an economy that's twice as big as it was. That should suggest that you have twice as many people employed. It should suggest that you have twice as much tax revenue. When it comes to the solutions to Namibia's problems, it has to be growth. And because government can't stimulate growth, we have to create an environment that allows private sector to stimulate growth. If we continue on the path that we're on now, we will have a 10 years where we see no growth and possibly 10 years where our economy actually shrinks. We've had three of them already. Um, and so if we have a, this extended period of no growth, think about what we're foregoing in terms of the potential jobs, potential tax revenue, et cetera. And this is all because of poor policy. If you look at the statement by Fitch, they don't blame the outside world. The outside world is growing. But if you look at our response from our Ministry of Finance, it blames the outside world. So we're not taking responsibility for the fact that we need to be creating, um, we need to be creating an, a domestic environment that um, enables and enhances growth. Instead, we're blaming other people. And there's the old saying, the first part, the first um, part of fixing a problem is admitting that you have one. And we're not admitting that we have a problem here. And what we do see at the moment is that we're messing around with policy on the fringes, but we're not diving in and making radical policy reforms. And that's really what we need to do. You know, we hear daily about more uh, plans for more tax from government. Well, this is blatantly not investor friendly. This is blatantly uh, anti-investment. And yet that's the type of policy that's constantly floating around here. Uh, and what we desperately need to do is heavily deregulate and make it much, much easier for the marginal businesses to survive, to grow, to employ, to pay uh, revenue to government. And I don't think that we're at that point of radical reform yet. Roland, the average investor sitting on the sidelines, um, considering Namibia as a potential investment opportunity, how does he view the country at the moment? Well, I think that we can see that in the numbers. So I don't need to talk in anecdotes because we have good data on this. So we've got the lowest levels of gross fixed capital formation, which is basically investment into fixed assets. We've got the lowest levels that we've had since 1987. If we look at foreign direct investment into the country, we've got the third lowest level since independence. And that's in 2018, 2019, the situation, if anything, is getting worse. At the same time, because we're not making these radical policy reforms and because we've now been through this extended period of no growth, we're getting downgraded time and time again, the response from the policymakers is lackluster, to say the least. And because of that, I think that these... Uh, the, the investors that are currently sitting on the sideline, both in the country and global investors, and most of the investors in the country are global investors, or many are global investors as well. But generally, these investors are not looking at us favorably at the moment. And when we see the, the, the discussion, as I mentioned, we're talking about a dividend tax towards the end of this year. It's just another sort of nail in the coffin as far as investment is concerned. I always tell people there's only four components of GDP. So there's household consumption, government spending, net exports, and investment. Household consumption is under huge pressure because households don't have a lot of money. Wages uh, are not increasing faster than inflation. Unemployment, formal sector unemployment is rising. Debt levels are high, etc. So they're not going to be driving growth. We all know the situation on, with regards to government's finances. Very dire. I mean, this rating, I think, um, makes that very clear. Um, and then net exports, well, that's exports minus imports. We're not going to grow exports without investment, and we're not going to reduce imports without investment. So investment is really the key. And investment is the component of GDP that can contribute to household uh, consumption growth, to government revenue, and therefore government expenditure growth, and also to net export growth. So if we continue down this path of not making radical reforms around investment, we will continue to stagnate like this. One thing that's interesting in the Namibian instance, however, is that Unlike many countries that have floating uh, currency arrangements, Namibia has a currency peg. And so many of the, of the macroeconomic issues that we have in the country get hidden by that. The problem that we sit with here is that that currency peg is not finite. Or well, it's not infinite, sorry, it's finite. And there is a risk that if we continue down this path, that that currency peg is going to come under severe pressure. And then you get years and years of imbalances in the local economy unwinding all at once, and you can have very rapid depreciation in your currency if, if we ever see a currency peg decoupling. I don't believe that this is being taken seriously enough by policymakers. We don't like talking about the currency peg because it's a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy if you're not careful. But it's something that policymakers really have to take seriously at this point. 
Roland, these are all very difficult conversations for the man in the street, the normal um, consumer. But how worried should Namibians be in general? So I think it I think you should be very worried. The fact that we have some of the highest unemployment and sustained unemployment in the world, there's 30 plus percent unemployment that's sustained for a long period of time, that's extremely abnormal by global standards. The fact that every second young person in the country is unemployed, that is extremely abnormal by global standards. And business as usual is just going to make the situation a lot worse. If you consider the situation that we've had over the last 30 years, we've had enormous issues to deal with. But we also had a relatively well-resourced government, and we always had surplus debt capacity, so government could borrow if there were ever any emergency issues. We had reasonably good bulk service infrastructure. We're now sitting in a situation where we don't have those buffers that we used to have, and we're in a very, very difficult domestic environment. We're not taking full responsibility for it and saying we need to make radical reforms. We need to look at what the successful countries of the world have done. Um, and we are, I think, in a situation of stagnation that's not going to resolve itself over the next half decade at least unless we see those very radical reforms. Roland, if government were to ask you for one recommendation that they would implement immediately, what would that be? So we have to be, we have to be pro-investment. If we don't attract, we don't have enough capital in the country, we, we know that we're a capital deficient economy. If you listen to budget speeches, if you listen to president speeches, SONA, etc., you'll often hear about this issue that we have around attracting capital. We need to attract foreign investment, we need to bring pension fund money back into the country because we need that investment in the country. So we admit that we're a capital deficient economy. So we need to be a capital friendly economy if we want to attract that capital. At the moment what we've been doing is we've been changing pension fund regulation that forces your pension, my pension, and the pensions of everybody else in the country to be taken away from where they've been invested for their best return, which is in your interest and my interest. We're mainly interested in, in ensuring that we have enough money to retire with and bring that money back to the country, which we can do by through regulation. So we can force that. But money isn't choosing to come to Namibia. And we need to make money choose to come to Namibia, to invest in Namibia, to start businesses in Namibia, to create jobs in Namibia, to pay revenue to government in Namibia. So there's a multiplicity of things that we need to do in order to make that successful. But that should be our, the entirety of our focus at the moment. It should be how do we get you know, capital into the country to create jobs, create wealth, create um, uh, revenue for government. And if our approach is this sort of multi-pronged approach of how do we fix this issue plus that issue plus the next issue plus the next issue, we will never really we, – we're prioritizing everything and therefore prioritizing nothing. And if we don't fix that investment issue, our ability to fix all of the other socioeconomic and social issues in the country is going to be massively curtailed. And this is what we warned about as far back as 2015. We said we're not going to achieve our development objectives if government runs out of money. And in 2015 already we knew government was coming into this position. So if government runs out of money, how do we fix poverty? How do we fix inequality? How do we fix housing, etc.? So we have to make sure that we have money in the country to be able to fix these socioeconomic problems. That is the catalytic um, component of um, the, the, the sort of resolve of the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment. We have to get that right, and we're not doing that. Roland, thank you very much for your input. Thanks.